I'm Peter Solanke, VP of Engineering at CoreWeb. Uh, who is CoreWeb? We are a specialized cloud provider. Um, we uh, focus only on high performance workloads. What that means is anyone who needs uh, a lot of compute power, uh, predominantly machine learning, training or inference, but also molecular dynamics and similar use cases. Uh, we're a bit younger cloud than your traditional hyperscalers. We started building our stack in 2018. Um, and unlike when, when Amazon and Likes started building their cloud, we had some new, very interesting technologies available to us, uh, namely containers and Kubernetes. We also realized that all of the major supercomputers in the world uh, were not running VMs. They're running bare metal. So the choice for us to start building with Kubernetes on bare metal um, was a pretty easy one, right? It made, made a lot of sense, um, much less overhead, and really great patterns to, to manage and deploy software. The, the road to running Kubernetes on bare metal is not necessarily as easy as it seems, and we'll get into that right now. Um, in, this, in this presentation, we're gonna focus on a specific um, cluster that we built uh, as part of our, our cloud fleet. Uh, it's the one that we used in May, June to um, set the MLPerf record on the LLM training benchmark. Uh, the, the project started in, in earnest in January when we started building one of the absolutely first NVIDIA H100 uh, training clusters um, together with our customer Inflection AI. Uh, the MLPerf benchmark itself uh, was run over 3,500 GPUs uh, and finished the, the benchmark in 11 minutes. The MLPerf LLM benchmark is a GPT-free uh, model structure uh, and, uh, and model size, 175 billion parameters. It's not trained to convergence. Obviously, it takes a little bit longer than 11 minutes, uh, at least on this cluster, maybe not the next one. Uh, but it gives you an, an approximation for a true LLM training workload. Uh, the cluster itself at the time of training had 3,500 NVIDIA H100 GPUs. Uh, these are all interconnected into a supercomputer using InfiniBand uh, network technology. Uh, there's 400 miles of fiber uh, inside this um, supercomputer, which is all housed inside one sector of a data center. So it's a lot of fiber in a small area. Uh, and there are 40,000 connections on, uh, um, between the systems. So you have a fiber, goes into a switch, goes into another switch. Each of these connectors connect on optics. They all need to be clean before you put them in. And if any of these fail, you have per de performance degradation in your cluster. Uh, and the results that we got were 30 times faster than the next, next nearest competitor. Um, so let's dig in how this cluster is built, what are components, and what will fail, and how we handle it. Um, the servers themselves, it's a 4RU or 6RU or 8RU server. Uh, they contain eight NVIDIA H100 HDX uh, GPUs. Uh, and then they have eight InfiniBand NICs with eight uplinks and two Ethernet uplinks. So there's a total of 10 fibers coming out of the system. All 10 can fail, and each individual failure can be catastrophic to the job. These are also configured in what you call a rail-optimized configuration, but not, not dig too much into that. Uh, so this is how it looks in a data center. So you'll see you have rows of core switching racks. This is where all the InfiniBand cables go back. This is one of our core groups. Uh, there's actually eight of these in one of the builds. Um, you have 400 miles of InfiniBand um, fiber, uh, standard multimode fiber. And then you have the servers uh, to your upper right there, where you see eight, eight uh, cables going in for InfiniBand in the back, front through GPU servers. Any failure of any of these components uh, will tear down the job, uh, because all these GPUs are working together. All the 3,500 plus GPUs uh, are working together in one single job, and a single failure will cause a failure for a job. It has a restart from a last checkpoint, and you lose a lot of your training time. So ensuring that your nodes are, are healthy and your entire fabric is healthy uh, is, is critical to not lose performance on these very expensive AI training machines. So to actually build this and get it running, and get it running faster than pretty much anyone else out there, um, we build a couple of, of core components. Uh, we choose Kubernetes to be very flexible in how we deploy our software. Uh, we run them on bare metal to skip the virtualization overhead, and we boot everything statelessly. Uh, 
uh, after the nodes are booted, there's a full suite of validations that we run, uh, both during burn-in and uh, continuously, and gather all the metrics and act on them immediately. And once the nodes are up and healthy, we need to actually run the workloads. Uh, we can either run them in Kubernetes, uh, using many of the schedulers or proprietary schedules discussed earlier this week, uh, or we can run them using traditional HPC scheduler slur. Uh, we're gonna cover all these three steps in the next couple of slides. Starting with how we boot uh, the bare metal nodes. The, system, uh, the, the systems are delivered without any OS on them. We don't want them to come with any OS from the vendor because things change constantly, right? We have new diaries to deploy, new kernels, these are new CPUs. Uh, can't really expect anything that's preloaded in the factory to work for us. Inside each server, we have an NVIDIA Bluefield 2 or Bluefield 3 uh, DPU, data processing unit. Uh, what, what these do in the stack is they help us provide our VPC isolation, since all of our, we're a cloud, everything is multi-tenant. They provide isolation between customers, and they also act to serve the boot image for the node. I'm not going to go too much into um, the DPU stack itself in this presentation. That's a whole different talk. Uh, but what's important to note is that these DPUs, is basically a smart NIC with a Raspberry Pi on them, um, they also run Kubernetes. And they, uh, they connect to a DPU management cluster uh, where there's a CRD running that tells them that this specific node, node number A, uh, should boot this image and join this Kubernetes cluster. Then when a node boots, it pulls a stateless image. It's an Ubuntu uh, image. Um, very tiny, but it has GPU drivers, some infinite band drivers, and a kubelet. Uh, it gets a join token from the DPU via cloud in it and joins a Kubernetes cluster. Whenever a node reboots, there's no persistent state on a node. It does the same process again. Pulls an image, like it's the first time it booted, and joins a Kubernetes cluster. This way, everything is stateless. There's no manual provisioning of node. There's no state drift. Um, it's fully ephemeral, which means we can plug in new nodes and get them up and running, joining a Kubernetes cluster immediately. Uh, moving on to the next phase, node lifecycle. So nodes come online, we need to make sure they're healthy, and we need to, to um, continuously um, keep them that way. Uh, we picked Kubernetes as our source of truth. This means that we don't have any other databases uh, storing information about you know, what is a node, is it up, uh, who does it belong to. Uh, everything is in Kubernetes. Uh, I like to say that Kubernetes is a database, and it kind of is, right? It's etcd, it's an API server, and CRDs is a, a schema for objects. And then you can do nice watches, and there's great patterns for writing reconcilers and controllers. So building an ecosystem around Kubernetes makes it very easy for us to, to plug in new things uh, and uh, get metrics out into different metric store without having to build a bunch of glue in between proprietary systems and, and Kubernetes itself. Um, we flow all data from Kubernetes, from, from Kubernetes states, uh, up to Prometheus uh, for observability and for alerting. And then once data is in Prometheus, we can take actions on this, both automatically or manually from an, an operations uh, point of view. Uh, and you will see the theme of how everything is, a, how Kubernetes is our database um, as we go along. We use a bunch of open source tools and a couple of proprietary controllers uh, in our stack. Uh, node problem detector uh, that many of you probably use is, uh, is a very core building block. It doesn't come with a lot of detections from out of the block, uh, box, but it allows us to easily plug in um, different triggers on, say, kernel messages and kernel logs. Um, Kubernetes itself kind of expects you to have happy nodes, right? Like when you run Kubernetes on, on a, version, uh, a VM from a cloud provider, it's usually happy. In itself, Kubernetes doesn't have a lot of health checks for nodes going bad. It doesn't handle nodes being in half bad states well at all. Uh, so we need to build a lot of tooling around it. Uh, we use the standard node exporter, the DCGM exporter, to get node and GPU metrics, Prometheus for our, our metric store, Luki for log aggregation and querying, uh, Grafana, Grafana on-call for, for visualizing to our operations teams. Uh, we have proprietary Redfish exporter and Redfish controller to talk to the out-of-band management of nodes. This is used to get out-of-band metrics, firmware inventory, and do things like reboot the node when you don't want to reboot it from the OS. 
uh, we have our proprietary lifecycle controller, uh, and Argo workflows, which is used to, to execute health checks. We'll talk more about. Digging into lifecycle controller and how to handle life, bare metal node lifecycle in, in Kubernetes. Uh, as I said earlier, Kubernetes expects happy nodes. If you just plug in a node, boot, you can probably schedule a pod on it. Um, does it have networking? Hopefully. You have to see if the Kubelet thinks is ready, you know, pods will schedule it. Doesn't really mean that your GPUs are healthy. Doesn't mean that your networking is actually working, uh, that you can access persistent storage, uh, and so on. Uh, this is what, what, why we developed what we call the node lifecycle controller. Uh, node lifecycle controller acts on states, and states can either be a Kubernetes label, annotation, or a node condition. It will then take the, the node through its journey uh, be, up until it's in production, and even when it's in production, to take it out of production uh, on some kind of fault or condition. Um, it starts by verifying that the node is physically correct. It has all the disks it should have. It has all the InfiniBand connections it, it should have. It's connected to the right uh, InfiniBand switch and Ethernet switch and so on. It then takes us for an up firmware upgrade process where we want to upgrade the firmwares of all the GPUs, the BIOS, the um, BMC of the node. Especially with these new platforms, there's a lot of changes in the, in the kind of microcontroller software running on them. Um, so you need to be prepared and have an automated way to upgrade all these components um, at, a, at a very frequent cadence. Uh, once the node is up, verified, and uh, upgraded, uh, we run a battery of self-tests. Uh, they run for 24 hours, and this includes everything from testing GPUs and so on. Um, talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, once the tests have passed, the nodes are put into production. This means the customers can schedule on them, and we can run uh, things like our big MLPerf training job. Uh, when a node is in production, the core node controller takes over. Um, this controller is responsible for labeling nodes with metadata. Again, Kubernetes is our database. So metadata about you know, node's location, its placement in the fabric, and so on, is all written on the node object. Uh, the node controller also handles lifecycle events like a reboot, which is requested either by a customer or an admin of ours, reaches out via Redfish to do so. Uh, a very detailed state diagram of the, the um, lifecycle controller. Uh, not going to go into to everything that's going on here, uh, but there's some, a couple of, of important themes here. As you see, the Kube API server is central. Every action flows through Kubernetes. There's no path that doesn't go through Kubernetes. If an admin uh, here on the left requests a reboot of a node, he does so by setting a condition on the node, and then the node controller we, will go out, reach out through Redfish uh, to that node's BMC, out of band management interface, and trigger that reboot. Why we force everything to go via Kubernetes? It's because we get built-in flow for event logging via Kubernetes events. We, it's clear on the node, you can describe it, what was the last condition taken? And we can use metrics exporting through, uh, say, kube state metrics and kube node labels to get all of this in Prometheus automatically. Um, by centralizing the entire management flow in Kubernetes, we can get a lot of stuff for free, and we also get a programming model when different teams need to interact with this that they know, because a lot of people know how to program against Kubernetes. Um, you also see on the top, there's a Redfish exporter, goes Prometheus, that goes to something called Epimetheus, which is basically a converter from Prometheus alerts to conditions, back to the, to the API server. What this means that if there's some kind of alert on a node, um, say a, a bad GPU, um, we can ultimately feed that back as a condition uh, on the node, and then since the node controller or node lifecycle controller acts on conditions, we can take an action on it. So this full flow that's driven by uh, labels and conditions that are set on nodes. And an X script from a node described uh, shows how we use, use the Kubernetes to stick all of our metadata. Uh, the first two rows, first two annotation, shows an output from our automated health tests. In this case, the GPU has, uh, has a failure, uh, and we even have from the health test that it should be submitted for RMA, so our ops team knows what to, what to do with the node. Um, you see some topology information in, in HPC clusters. Uh, topology and location is important. When you schedule your 
ML training workloads, you want them to be close to each other on the network. So annotate every node with where they are in the Infinity Band fabric, uh, which switches they're connected to, so we can verify connect, uh, correctness. Um, we annotate the node with what we call a uh, firmware bundle, which says this is the firmware that this node should have. And then the node lifecycle controller knows to, to reconcile it to those firmwares if that differs. Uh, you also have the state down here, which is a very unsuspecting label, but, but a core in, in the entire, um, uh, entire process, uh, which is a label that drives the node controller to say, what state is in this node in? Right now, it's in broken. It was automatically put in broken based on the test failure. Um, and when it's in broken, it won't be available to customers to run workloads on. The node will be cordoned off and so on. Looking at another describe of node conditions, you can see a slew of node conditions here. Some of these are set by the node problem detector, then the node con controller can act, uh, act on that. Um, I, the GPU fault condition, which is based on a, a kernel log. Uh, some of these are set from alerts, uh, like the network alert fault, uh, where an alert is acted uh, as triggered on a node and we set a condition on it so the node controller can act on it. And some are set by admins. There's the admin maintenance mode in the bottom um, that one of our operations engineers can set when he wants to take out the node for maintenance of some reason. And the node controller will then cordon it off uh, from the customer, make sure there's no workload running on it before he lets admin do any work on it. And since all these states um, are labels or conditions, they're already exported for us for free uh, to Prometheus uh, via kubestate metrics, kube node labels. So it's making it very easy for us to visualize what's going on in the cluster. So this is a visualization of the node controller, uh, node controller lifecycle. We see the node starts kind of in onboarding, goes through a different test phasing. Zap is when we upgrade firmwares. Um, test is the 24 hour test window we do when nodes boot you know, the first time. And then a bunch of them are in production. And then you have post-production phases with uh, debugging or broken RMA nodes. Uh, since the test times are an annotation on a node, we can very nicely graph how long time nodes have left in their, their self-test phase. Uh, talking a bit about our burn-in testing. Uh, when a node starts up for the first time, we put it through a 24-hour burn-in test cycle. Uh, these tests are run um, via Argo workflows. Um, they, they run it's a, continuously over the course of 24 hours, or about six hours each iteration, so we run four of them. Uh, and they test everything from PCI performance, uh, NVLink, NVSwitch performance for NVIDIA GPUs, uh, InfiniBand performance all across the fabric, CPU, Ethernet, looks for any error counters. If any of these fails, uh, the, an alert is raised, and the node controller can automatically move it from the testing state to the testing failed state for manual intervention. Uh, after a node is in production, we keep running these tests. So the Argo workflow, as it's written, checks, are there available, is there any pods running on the node consuming GPUs? Uh, assuming the node is idle, we can run a test. So we continuously test nodes that are idle. The tests are run at a lower priority class than normal jobs, which means that customer jobs will preempt these tests as soon as they start running. Um, but since we continuously test the nodes, we don't have to wait for a customer to tell us, oh, this node is broken, because we usually find that out, uh, hopefully, before they do. And since everything is in Kubernetes, we can easily graph these results and get nice state timelines for different nodes, like I'm showing here, uh, that shows you a set of four nodes with different issues, um, and one of, them, one of those issues started here at the end of the, end of the timeline where the test ran. All the logs from all of these are easily piped up with Luki, and we can, exp uh, can parse the log results from different tests to graph these over time as well. Here's a test uh, result for, for high performance limb pack uh, over a part of our fleet. Um, and we're looking really for trends here. Say the new driver version is released. We want to make sure that, that um, performance isn't degrading or a new BMC version or even environmental changes in, in the data center or part of the data center. Uh, we develop dashboards for our ops technicians to use when they troubleshoot nodes. This is a very, like, one-fifth of this dashboard. Uh, but having all this data available to us in Prometheus and Luki makes it so easy to bring it all together in one place uh, and give a really clear view for anyone who needs to, to dig in and troubleshoot nodes. Um, 
we also use the Grafana stack for alerting. We use it together with PagerDuty, uh, but Grafana on-call uh, provides really beautiful visualization of alerts in Slack. Uh, so it makes it very easy for, for operations technicians uh, to go and see, okay, this node alerted. I can get a nice timeline. When did it have any alerts previously? Uh, if it did, so I can immediately know what, what might I have to do with this node if there's nothing that can be done uh, with it automatically. The node controller also listens to alerts uh, and can also take, uh, take action on alerts uh, if it's a well-known issue, like a, a GPU has crashed. Uh, we know that, okay, this node needs to be moved out from the customer's environment because it probably needs an RMA. So we do that automatically as well. Okay, so now we have a bunch of healthy nodes. Uh, they're up and running. We vetted out the broken ones, and we got this continuous cycle of, of node health. Now, how do we run training jobs on, on, uh, on our cluster? Uh, we started out building this very cloud-native, um, pods for everything. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in this space with running uh, large training jobs on Kubernetes. There are, there are schedulers, which is a co-scheduler. There's the MPI operators. Uh, there's companies like Run AI, Kubeflow, uh, building frameworks for these. Um, and some of them are great, and some of them are getting better, better every day. Uh, however, in the traditional HPC community, people like Slurm. Slurm is a HPC workload scheduler. It is a couple of years old. Um, and um, it's built for, for really a tr supercomputer world where you, know, you spend two years building a supercomputer, and then you test it, and then all your you know, X thousand of CPUs and GPUs are up, and it's very staticky. That doesn't really work in today's age of rapid AI evolution, right? Where we build these, uh, we build these clusters, and as soon as there is one node or eight GPUs online, a customer wants to start, start running on them. Uh, so we need something that is agile, and we can upgrade it quickly. We don't want to take down the entire cluster for maintenance for a week to upgrade all the components uh, like you could do with a you know, traditional HPC university environment. But people coming from research, coming from these HPC environments, are used to the Slurm and want to use Slurm. Uh, so how, how do we solve that? Uh, so we built something called Slurm on Kubernetes, uh, codename Sunk. Has I mean, with a name, yeah, if you look at the, the Kubernetes theme, maybe it means that it's syncing. I don't know. Um, no comment on that. But, um, um, but we tried to integrate Slurm uh, with its very non-cloud native architecture uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, it's a very detailed diagram how Slurm and Kubernetes works. Uh, but the important pieces are everything is containerized. All the uh, controller pieces are containerized. The Slurm CTLD, Slurm D. Uh, logging nodes, which are traditionally a bare metal uh, server that you know hundreds of researchers SSH into and do work and launch jobs from uh, multi-tenant, are also a container. And we can launch multiple replicas or individual logging nodes for individual researchers instead of having needing to have a VM or a bare metal machine that 100 people are multiplexed over. Uh, the Slurm daemon that actually runs the training jobs is also a container. Uh, Slurm in itself does a bunch of C groups and so on, if you're familiar with that, and all of that will inherit from the, the pod C group tree. Uh, so the m most, if not all, Slurm functionality uh, works kind of out of the box in this, uh, this pattern with slight modifications that we had made. Then there are a couple of interesting controllers. Uh, we have what we call a node set controller, which basically acts as a daemon set. So what this means is that it will run one of these Slurm daemons on every node in your cluster that should be running Slurm. And it runs them without consuming all the resources on the node. Uh, so what that means is that Slurm is running, you can launch jobs in Slurm, uh, but you can also launch jobs in Kubernetes. So we have the, the Slurm Kubernetes scheduler integration, uh, where the Slurm scheduler acts as a scheduler plugin to Kubernetes. Uh, when is this useful? One example is if you have a cluster that's used by researchers uh, to train your foundational models, right? You're training a huge new LLM. Um, but you also have production inference running on it. And production inference, you really want to run that in Kubernetes, right? Uh, it's okay, Slurm, you know, we got this kind of old pattern of working. It works great for batch jobs, but it's really not a good fit for long-running critical services. So we want to run inference in Kubernetes pods 
but training in Slurm. And inference traffic, you know, you have people wild from the internet coming to your app, you know, chat GPT style. Um, traffic can fluctuate. So we want our autoscalers in Kubernetes to be able to manage our Kubernetes pods. Uh, and when there's a burst in your inference traffic, we want to be able to preempt unimportant jobs in Slurm. Say that you have, you know, uh, one big pre-training job that you don't want to preempt, runs at the highest priority class, uh, but you have some research jobs that you will easily want to preempt for, for more inference capacity. Uh, so the Slurm Kubernetes scheduler integration allows the Slurm scheduler with its very advanced preemption gang scheduling um, concepts to manage the scheduling of these Kubernetes pods. Uh, so instead of using something like you know, Volcano or whatever in Kubernetes, we actually leverage the Slurm's scheduler even for Kubernetes. And Kubernetes pods show up inside Slurm, and we can use Slurm accounting and all those uh, Slurm features for our Kubernetes pods without really compromising on those things running in proper containers in proper container isolation from Kubernetes. Um, and we also export all of our metrics from Slurm, of course, into Prometheus. Um, and since we have all of our other metrics there, uh, we can create these real nice informative dashboards, taking metrics from the job running itself. So here we're running the MLPerf um, uh, record-breaking job. Uh, we can see that there was an interruption there. Something crashed. You can see that the, uh, the, the flops counter goes to zero. Uh, and by, by overlaying the alerts as annotations on top, we can see very quickly see that, okay, this job stopped because a GPU fell off the bus, fell off the PCI bus. Um, so this doesn't only help ourselves to diagnose like when there are issues with the cluster. We can also expose these to customers so they have full insight into what's, what's happening with our big training clusters, not one opaque black box where things work and things don't work. Uh, Slurm on Kubernetes uh, will be open sourced uh, in the beginning of next year. Um, we believe this is important to, to marry traditional um, HPC work with, with Kubernetes and uh, how containers should be run. More data center picture, and moving on to questions. Go for it. What advantage does Kubernetes bring to the HPC community? Um, it it brings so why we like it, right? Is you can roll out software more piecemeal and better isolated. We can build containers. I mean, it's really all about containers, being able to package, package up uh, your dependencies uh, or your different components um, as containers, roll them out quickly, upgrade piecemeal. And then you have a, sh a whole, you know, whole ecosystem of tooling that is really built around Kubernetes. We talked about Prometheus, Loki, like, yeah, you can use all of these outside of Kubernetes, but by running in Kubernetes, you get to take advantage of everything that all these great open source developers that are probably all around here today have built. And retrofitting them in on a more you know, traditional model with like Chef, Ansible, you can do it, but buying in gives you a lot of stuff uh, for free. Uh, then we also have, you know, like isolation, like Slurm, these traditional HPC environments, not really that, that tight on security in my mind. It's easy to have noisy neighbor problems, uh, to get visibility into each other's jobs. They're not really, um, you know, it come not traditionally built from like a university perspective where, okay, we want, you know, we want like people to keep their data apart, but if I know what my neighbor is working on, it's not really a big deal. And this is changing when we're building, you know, these AI models and so on that are either very expensive to build because they take thousands of expensive GPUs to train, or uh, they're, they're critical because, you know, they're, they're, um, the level they operate at, we're very worried from leaking out. So using the Kubernetes to, for our back and for isolation is just better than anything has been in traditional HPC. Uh, great talk. Yeah, Yuan Chen. Can you hear me? Sorry? Yeah, Yuan Chen from Apple. Uh, first question and uh, clarification question about the sunk. So as for Slurm running on Kubernetes, did you mention you run Slurm as a plugin of the native scheduler or it's a standard known and a separate scheduler? Uh, no, so, the, the, so it, it runs, yeah, so the sunk syncer, I'm gonna pull up this diagram again, maybe this, this diagram is best. Um, so the, 
this, yeah, so it doesn't actually use the native scheduler. scheduler. So the, it's a different, you set on your pod, it's a different scheduler name, uh, and the, um, the sunk syncer is a scheduler implementation. So it talks to scheduler, I mean, it acts as a scheduler, and then uh, talks to the Kubernetes scheduler to actually schedule the pod. So it, it's not a plug-in to the native scheduler, like the native scheduler is not involved in scheduling the pods at all. Yeah, then I think previous slides you mentioned, you can run both Slurm job and Kubernetes job on the same node. Yep. So the Kubernetes job and uh, are scheduled by the native and the Kubernetes schedule, then how do you resolve the risk condition, the conflicts? S exactly, so the, it's, you can run both Slurm jobs and Kubernetes pods, but both of them are scheduled by the Slurm scheduler. So you're replacing, you're replacing the Kubernetes scheduler uh, with the Slurm scheduler. Uh, so this means that there are some things that Slurm, the Kubernetes scheduler can do that you won't get, uh, but for a lot of functionality, especially when it comes to these type of workloads, uh, the Slurm scheduler is a superset of the Kubernetes scheduler. You know, we can do very advanced preem preemption, gang scheduling, um, and bin packing, is topology aware. So you would use, you would use the um, Slurm scheduler for all your pods. You know, short daemon sets and so on that kind of run in the background, you don't use it for, but for anything that like, uses up resources, you would use the Slurm scheduler. Otherwise, you would have very weird conflicts and wouldn't be good at all. Okay, got it. Second question about your node provisioning, node registration. Have you used and cluster API? If not, and uh, any reason why not use cluster API? The cluster API? Uh -huh. Yes, so I didn't actually talk about how we instantiate these clusters. So we run multiple Kubernetes clusters, obviously we have multiple uh, customers and they own, there's a couple of different uh, models, how we provision them. There was a talk on that yesterday. Um, by my colleague Brandon, um, but we, we have our own cluster operator which exposes our CRD and that's how we, uh, how we instantiate clusters. It's not actually the cluster API right now, it's our own CRD because some philosophical differences, but principle is the same. So we instantiate new clusters uh, with the CRD and that really happens before uh, anything in the presented today. So the, cluster, the cluster API service and so on are created um, before any node is booted, they run in a separate management cluster, much like GKE or AKS, and then nodes are booted into this cluster, and that's where all the node lifecycle happens. Great, thanks. Again, yeah, great talk. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Hi, um, you mentioned that you, when nodes are idle, you've got, uh, you know, you're running testing. Have you, is there a balance between how exhaustively you test them and like the cost of uh, power to do that test? And because obviously, an idle node doesn't draw power the same way as a lit node. So have you done analysis on sort of that cost benefit um, and how much you, you heat them up? Yeah, th th there is, and that's a constant debate between me and our uh, facilities team, who doesn't like me to run them at 100% load all the time. Um, and so it, it kind of, the, the compromise we have to right now is they run, the ongoing test runs once every hour. They take about 30 minutes, and then there's 30 minutes of downtime. So that's, yeah, you know, 50-50. Um, and Probably could run it less, to be honest. Uh, could run it run it uh, less frequent, uh, to, and it was still cache issues. Uh, we're pretty early in the li in, in the life cycle of these components, especially focusing on the H100, right? Um, as the cluster matures, like there's a huge curve where you know most of your issues happen in the first two months and then it goes down from there. So as the clusters mature, we can probably decrease that even further. Uh, but right now, you know, at the time where we are, where GPUs are so scarce and it's so important for everyone to have healthy GPUs. Like, yes, we're gonna spend some extra money on power uh, and put some extra load on the data centers to make sure that we have, you know, as many healthy GPUs as we can for our customers. Yeah, I mean, I guess rerunning jobs that break halfway through is also it, Yes, and, and so it's, you know, since these, the jobs take such a long time, you have to load from checkpoint, start up Megatron or whatever framework you're using, uh, like it can easily take you, you know, half an hour to restart the job and it's, it's very painful. I'm wondering uh, how much uh, power are you running to the racks and how are you handling coolants? Uh, okay, that's a great question. Uh, very much outside of node lifecycle. So it depends on the data center. We have um, like 15 different data centers plus uh, around the US right now and there's gonna be like 40 uh, in a year. Um, some, okay, that's our average is 17 kWs per rack, uh, which is, um, is just easier. Uh, you know, since these things are so dense to begin with, like space is usually not a problem because most buildings are built to like eight kilowatts per rack. Uh, the one, this specific cluster uh, is, uh, we're, we're running at 18 kilowatts per rack. 
uh, no, sorry, we're running at 32 kilowatts per rack, but most of the builds are, are, uh, are less than that to, to let's give more, um, give more sp space. All of it is air cooled currently. Uh, next year, I think we'll see a lot of things switch to direct to chip liquid cooled. As there are newer generations of GPUs coming out, they're gonna I guess, consume so much power that is infeasible to, uh, to air cool them. So one more question. Uh, what are you using for the base system that you're plugging the H100s into, and how many do you get per rack? Um, yes, so the, the each, each H100, each GPU H100 system consumes about 8 kilowatts of power. So if you have a 16 kilowatt rack, you get kind of two, and with a 32 kilowatt rack, we get four. Uh, the base system, we work with a couple of different OEMs. Uh, one of them is Supermicro, as an example. It's all, all H100 HDX system. Great, I've seen that one, thank you. Sorry, I think you just, I think you just answered my question. No, those were Supermicro chassis in the, in the data. And in the picture, or yes. Were, were they weren't DGXs? Uh, they're not, not DGXs, not HDXs. Okay. okay, cool, thank you. So, hello, I have two questions uh, related to the network. So the first one is that when you saw the DPU there, so you're using DPU to uh, provision the hardware first, like a download image and a create a node. So uh, how would you switch like from that uh, installment to the real Kubernetes environment? Yeah, so the, the DPU itself, uh, you know, it's a NIC, it has a CPU on it, it has its own OS. Um, so the DPU is always, always booted. It runs its own Ubuntu ARM CPU. Um, okay, I'm supposed to stop now. Uh, I'm gonna talk for one, one, 20, 30 more seconds. Has its own ARM CPU. So the DPU is always running. Uh, and then when the node boots, uh, the node has nothing on it and it sends a PXE. It's a PXE boots from the DPU. So there's a PXE server on the DPU which serves the image to the node. And when a node boots, is, there's no installation really. The node boots statelessly an image served from the DPU over Ethernet. So the, you know, talks from the server mm -hmm. up to the DPU over Ethernet. And then a node boots uh, an Ubuntu image in RAM. So the DPU acts to serve the image to the node. Did that so, answer your question? Uh, yeah, that, that's the, uh, yeah, I know that. But whether you transfer to the, cust the network that will be used by the customer. So the, the, how that's the, how like that's kind of management network, right? Uh, um, so the, the DPU itself has an ethernet port that connects to the management network. And then the, the DPU serves the customer towards the node. It exposes the customer's v VPC which is an eVPN VPC. So the customer's node, when it boots, is always inside the customer's VPC. And that's why, that's why the DPU is the one who serves the boot image, because inside the customer's VPC, there's, it can't reach anywhere where the boot image is. So the DPU does all the network magic to make the node think you know, it's talking to this private network, um, but it can still load in stuff like images and so on. So I, I have to stop now, so we can do questions like around here. <laughs>